Hello, and thank you for joining us for this stranger episode of Cinema Craptaculous Presents The Expanded Universe with your hosts, John H.H. H. Ford and Mario Doc Diaz. From movies to TV series to toys to comics to pop culture, this show is your safe space for all things geeky and where you can get your geek on. This is John H.H., H., and with me as always is my geek-tacular co-host... And s'more! Oh, shoot, that's not right. <laughs> right. Sorry, this is Doc. This is Doc. Right. S'more is not with us, so we will... I mean, he's with us. He's just not with us today in the show, right? Yeah, he's but, not with us. Right? Uh, yeah. Especially with the... We talk about him. Especially with today's uh, topic, Stranger Things. Uh, where did he go? Is he possibly in the underground or the upside down? He might. He might be sitting there. We should check our lights to see if they're buzzing. <laughs> uh, I, no, I don't. I don't see anything. Uh, S'more, if you're around, um, you know you're not communicating with us. So we're gonna just hope there's enough water, food, and a toilet nearby. Send us the signal. Do they have toilets in the upside down world? Uh, the upside down, all of the upside down looks like a giant toilet. So just anywhere, <laughs> you, just mark I think your you territory. Could just go anywhere. <laughs> mark, mark your spot, S'more. So you know we've gone through I don't know how many uh, years now of talking about streaming series. We talk about WandaVision, uh, The Mandalorian, all this stuff, and we've never really gotten into the biggest streaming series. I would say one of the biggest, probably in the top five since we've been considering streaming series thing, and that is you know the Duffer Brothers Stranger Things on Netflix. That, that's crazy. When you pointed that out, I couldn't I couldn't believe it that we've never done an episode on Stranger Things. It's kind of weird, and I think. I think part of it is that, you know, the show comes and goes in and out of our lives because, you know, it's not something where they they immediately have like, OK, and and this time next year we'll have, you know, the next season. I think like a lot of these really expensive crafted genre shows, Game of Thrones was kind of like that, where you would you would you might have to wait a little longer. And then with the pandemic, you know, we're waiting for everything. And so it finally came um, this summer in two parts with the second part just in the last like two weeks it dropped which is what they did with Ozark and we're going to go through it and just talk about what we liked and you know what what worked what didn't work and you know what lies ahead immediately doc what were your expectations going into season four? Oh well kind of like you pointed out <clears throat> we hadn't gotten an episode of Stranger Things in a while so and because there's so much TV on I guess I wasn't really anticipating anything I wasn't really thinking about the show uh, but when it showed up you know when it they dropped it I was excited look really looking forward to it and um yeah, it was really different. It had like a you know, different you know, type of story compared to the uh, previous seasons. Initially, I was kind of a little lukewarm on it. Um, but as we got closer to the end of the uh, part one, I got really excited and got really into it. So Yeah, I think that was a common reaction. I knew some people that were like, well, it's a little wacky. And then all of a sudden it was like, especially the horror fans, people who were yeah. into Nightmare on Elm Street and a lot of those 80s horror films, those people started to kind of feel the vibe and... You know, <laughs> right out of the gate, you know, you, you get these red shirt characters like, oh, new character, probably not going to make it at the end. And so, um, and you don't know that because in previous seasons, you know, sometimes they've grown the cast. But it did make me nervous because I think even coming into this season, it feels like there were a lot of characters. So I got worried for a number of them. And I think going into the horror genre was more of a natural progression in the sense that the kids are now old enough. You know, I read an interview with the Duffer Brothers and they said, well, we can't really stick with the Goonies type venture. It's got to kind of be something where the teenagers can kind of stand on their own. And horror, 80s horror is a genre where that really started. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of like the uh, Harry Potter effect. You know, like when Harry Potter first started uh, year one, it's the tone was lighter, more for kids. And as the kids in the story aged up, by the time they got to year seven, it was a lot darker and scarier. And then after, uh, since this is... So based in the 80s, well, it takes place in the 80s, of course, but has so many elements, uh, references to the 80s that uh, using horror elements, slasher films, Nightmare on Elm Street elements, that's it, per- it fits perfectly with uh, the storyline. So we're, all, we're probably going to get into spoilers. So I think anybody listening to this, if you have not watched season four, back out now because we're going to get into it. And I think that, you know, right out of the gate, we're dealing with a pretty impactful end of season three you know you've got the appearance of the mind flare in hawkins in this huge giant finale in the mall and i always love these shows because they'll have some huge incident and then the next season the public at large are like oh well there was a fire at the mall or you know oh yeah at the (laughs) hawkins lab there was you know a few people went missing but it was probably you know there's always a way it gets sort of brought back to normal like a simpsons episode (laughs) it's always a gas leak Hallucinations. It's a gas, right. 
<laughs> yeah. So they've got this giant mind flare they fight, and it claims a character from last season who was kind of a red shirt, but he'd been in, introduced in the previous season as uh, Billy, Max's uh, a-hole Rob Lowe slash rocker brother who uh, turns into a hero at the very end, but ultimately he gets taken. And then what happens to Hopper? Oh, yeah. They had that, that was a huge cliffhanger. Uh, you know, Hopper's easily become one of the, uh, the fan favorites on the show, uh, played by David Harbour. And at the very, very end, of course, it looks like he's obliterated. He like is just, you know, he disintegrates. And so we're just kind of left. We're kind of left. With That's like, where everybody's not- left. And it caps yeah. off a very odd season where they had the Russians who not only infiltrated the United States, but had somehow <laughs> built this entire infrastructure under the ground, you know, like, and I love in all these movies where they have these, you know, it's like 10 stories down and, you know, like the, the amount of labor and resources and infrastructure <laughs> to build something, but they were able to do it. So we find out that he actually isn't dead and he's in, we're guessing he's in a Russian prison, a gulag. And uh, that's where we pick up with him in this season that clearly has separated. It separates out the cast. Now, we can talk about where they, what they're all doing and who gets separated. But do you feel that that had to do with storytelling? Or do you think that was like a COVID decision? Kind of breaking everybody up into like Lord of the Rings where there's this group here and this group here and this group here. I think it was a storytelling decision because uh, kind of like what you mentioned over the uh, seasons, they've added new cast members. And I think... The cast has gotten so big that they're kind of like juggling these characters, trying to figure out what to do with them. And um, yes, it was kind of like three groups, and one of the groups had very little to do. Some characters that were more important in previous seasons were just kind of like in the background, or they would just make a comment or just have like one scene. Yeah, I I thought the story, the whole Hopper thing, would have gone a little gone down a little differently. But um, yeah, they were kind of separated pretty much the whole season. So. And it was its own storyline. So we pick up with Hopper and he is in this, basically, it's this, is it the same prison that his Red Crimson character was in in uh, <laughs> Black Widow? He's just, that's David Harbour's wheelhouse now is playing Russian prisoners. Uh, <laughs> only he's a prisoner in Russia, but he's in this very brutal prison. Yeah, they don't really get into it. Uh, probably, you know, happened off screen between seasons. I thought the portal, you know, led to the upside down. So. Right. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, in this latest season when they find Hopper, he had like, fallen down so he was still in the right side up but yeah. um yeah at some point they must have transported him well he's in a pretty rough spot with no friends and no hope of, of anybody knowing where he's at because if people think he's dead they're sure as hell not going to guess like oh you know what if he did make it out of there i'll bet he was captured by the russians and put in a prison in siberia no he is screwed and i give the actor credit because i mean he looked bad he lost a ton of weight shaved his head <laughs> He's beaten almost routinely. I mean, they really wanted to sort of make his life miserable. But there's a glimmer of hope because then we cut to our next group of characters, which is... Yeah, so the uh, second group is the uh, group that um, ends up in California. So uh, Elle and uh, Will and uh, Joyce and Jonathan, they all live in California now. And so um, so Mike, you know, he flies out there because he's on, on break. And so he's going to be reunited with Eleven. So they go out there and then they have like their whole misadventures thing. They show uh, Will and Eleven in school. Eleven's being bullied. And uh, yeah, the bullying is very like 80s. You know, it's in high school. It leads to the infamous roller rink scene. You want to talk about that, Ford? Yeah, we could talk a little bit about that. Um, I think that it's important to note that we're seeing Eleven depowered. Uh, was that established at the end of season three or is it just something they say? That was the very end of the previous season. Yeah, so she's best, basically a regular girl doing her best. You know, I mean, it's very hard. She has sort of no backstory as a person other than being a lab rat and until she walked into their world. And even in, you know, I was thinking about this, even though Eleven has had uh, these moments of being a regular kid, a regular teenage girl, you know, with a father and with friends, with a boyfriend, she still is pulled into these missions (laughs) to rescue everybody and embrace her, the thing that makes her weird and different, and that is this ability that she has based on being a lab rat. But she really doesn't get a chance to just be a girl. And so she's in a, an environment where she's lost her dad. She's kind of in an adopted family, but she just is still not fitting in. And the abject cruelty of 80s bullies is on display, you know? Yeah, kind of like you just pointed out, you know, she's she's an awkward teen. We completely forget that she's 
had this really different upbringing. She hasn't been around a lot of kids in that type of setting. So she's like kids they spot. It's like blood in the water. You know, so they're going to bully her. They're going to make fun of her. And then like you pointed out with, you know, her losing Hopper, it's very MCU moment where people were snapped away. But here Hopper disappeared and they think he's dead. And at some point, Choice mentions that uh, they did like mourn him. Yeah, it uh, all culminates in uh, her going a little crazy on the uh, on the main bully. Yeah, and that has some ramifications. And, and, you know, it's not possible in our episode to just recap the whole season. I mean, we yeah. would just do, this isn't kind of the crux of the conversation. I think we're going to have to skip through some beats to just sort of get to our reaction to it all. And as you just mentioned, they had the group in California. And it, did they shoot it in California? Because it certainly looked like the San Fernando Valley or it didn't look like Georgia, unless it's comped in. You never know. <laughs> you know, actually, I don't know. I haven't looked it up. But uh, yeah, you're right. It did look very much like California. And it was kind of cool seeing those kids in that setting because we're so used to seeing them in, you know, small town Hawkins. And to see them exposed to, you know, stereotypical L.A. fast times at Ridgemont High. I think the 80s is sort of a child of two worlds when it comes to teen culture. And there's the the John Hughes sort of the East Coast or Midwest, I should say, Chicago world of the John Hughes. And then there's also the L.A. world, which is, you know, Valley Girl and Fast Times and all those films of Karate Kid that are set in L.A. And you know, you're from LA and I have lived in LA, so I know all that. So I thought that was a cool idea. Didn't really say where they were. It could have been like Stockton or something, but definitely it was a change of environment and not going well for 11. And then we cut back to the Hawkins world and you've got a couple of new characters that <laughs> end up being red shirts. <laughs> but one in particular, this character has like a huge fan following. And I think you know who I'm talking about. Uh, would this be Eddie Munson? Eddie Munson. Eddie um, Munson. Can I level with you? Jeff graduates this year. Garrett's got, what, a year and a half? Me, I am army crawling my way toward a D in Miss O'Donnell's. If I don't blow her final, I'm going to walk that stage next month. I'm going to look Principal Higgins dead in the eye. I'm going to flip him the bird. I'm going to snatch that diploma. I'm going to run like hell out of here. (laughs) It's important to point out that I think I mentioned I didn't realize how many actors on Stranger Things are British. It's like half the cast. I knew Millie Bobby Brown is 11. I did not know about Jonathan Byers, played by Charlie Charlie Heaton. Heaton. Yeah. And then this guy who plays Eddie Munson, Joseph Quinn, he's British. And he plays this character that, I mean... I don't know about you, but I saw a lot of Eddie Munson's when I was in middle school and high school in the 80s. I mean, he, the look, the hair, the attitude, he looked a little older because <laughs> he hadn't graduated. <laughs> he was like held back like three years and, and then of course yeah. all, the, all the drugs too. So that kind of aged him quite a bit. It's not too far from, my name is Otto. I like to get blah <laughs> Well, when they first uh, introduced the character, I wasn't that into him. I was kind of like, eh. Move this character aside. I want to see the the main cast, but he definitely grew on me. Like by the end of uh, by the end of part one, where he was hanging out yeah. with the uh, with the main group or the the Hawkins crew, he was like with him a lot more in like the last four episodes or something or three episodes of part one. Well, he basically is the leader of the nerds, and it's interesting because he he's both a rocker dude, you know. And when I say rocker, I mean '80s rocker, Metallica, Black Sabbath. Van Halen, you know, we knew those guys. And Yet of course, he's Metallica. also right. And he's also in charge of the Hellfire sorry, Hellfire Club. Well no, yeah. which were they? Yeah, it's Hellfire Club. <laughs> Is it, yeah, which I'm thinking like, wait, are we gonna see uh, uh January Jones in a white bikini? Yeah, um, that's, with her that's diamond a, that's skin? A nod. Yeah, it's definitely a nod to the X Men. The X Men's Hellfire Club. But this Hellfire Club are a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons nerds. So you got Dustin, Lucas was in it, and we'll talk about his character and his little sister. And it's weird to see Eddie Munster, Eddie Munster, Eddie Munson <laughs> is sort of the, uh, the the king of the geeks. But in my world, is in a rocker guy would not have been the leader of Dungeons and Dragons. Almost like wanted to kind of combine the two genres to have both characters. But I think in reality, I think they'd be two separate characters. But that's just me. No, you, you never know because, uh, yeah, it's come out that a lot of celebrities, you know, today you know play dungeons and dragons on the side so you have i think henry cavill plays it like vin diesel so there's a there's quite a few so they're 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 closet D uh, fans it was cool to really kind of get back to it because that's where the show began it began on the board of dungeons and dragons and we know that the upside down world is this unresolved the world itself is almost a villain even though the mind flayer is this sort of evil that lurks into it um, it is something that you wonder, like, well, wh- when are they going to actually deal with the upside down world as a place other than someplace that you f- prevent 
people from going in or coming out of. And this was the season. And Eddie is... Uh, they, they make points that the Hellfire Club are a bunch of the demon worshippers, and they, they mention some news footage of, was it actual news stories of satanic worshipping tied to Dungeons and Dragons in the 80s? I don't remember. Yeah, you, oh, you don't remember that? I thought that was really good how they incorporated that, because that was really big in the 80s, where when Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons got really popular, it caused the controversy. People across you know the United States was saying that it was like worshipping the devil, starting cults, and they're worried that uh, teenagers uh, were being influenced and killing and doing bad things uh it got so big that they made a made for tv movie starring tom hanks and he tom hanks was this young guy who was into D, and he was hallucinating seeing things uh dragons and whatnot and uh, what? I, I really like i don't they, remember this at all i don't, don't remember the tom yeah. hanks and i certainly don't remember being tied to satan worshiping oh, my, yeah. my little my little hometown world was clearly isolated no, yeah, it totally was. And uh, yeah, when they brought that, they corp- incorporated that into this story, I was like, that's really cool. And I'm not sure, I th- thought I heard somewhere that the Eddie Munson character was like loosely based on, on a real person or something like that. But I thought it was really cool that they that they finally used that in the actual story. Well, there was a big baddie that gets revealed and he gets revealed in a Freddy Krueger way where mm-hmm. students are victimized in a dreamlike trance, much like in Nightmare on Elm Street where people totally. fall asleep. I didn't feel it as a ripoff. I felt like, no, no, everybody knows we're doing this as an homage to Nightmare. And the character's different. But as we start to learn, there's a mystery that actually is not so different. And mm-hmm. it involves the little Scooby kids seeing some of their classmates die in these gruesome manners. Eddie has a the you know one of the, the cheerleaders who's trying to just get away from these bad visions. She's trying to buy drugs off of him, uh, which is kind of a weird place to go, but i that's how they connect her to him. And she is killed in a very gruesome manner by this otherworldly being who we, we learn is, is a character named Vecna, which is based in the Dungeons world. And Eddie, of course, becomes prime suspect number one because it's his dad's trailer, and he disappears because he saw it and he's freaked out. So it stirs this whole subplot of... This Eddie character is now public enemy number one in Hawkins, and the jocks find out and think he's a big devil worshiper who killed, you know, the the head basketball player's girlfriend. And everybody's trying to go hunt him down. And the kids, Dustin in particular, think, oh, he's innocent. And, you know, they go to find him. And that's sort of their mission, right? Yeah, no, poor Eddie. Uh, Yeah, like you were saying, the cheerleader goes to him for the drugs. And it kind of does make sense. You know, it's like she's kind of doesn't have the experience with it and she knows that he's he's a pothead and that he partakes so she goes to him and unfortunately that's the night that Vecna takes her out um and it actually was uh Eddie's uncle's uh trailer but yeah. uh yeah a lot of like you're saying a lot of people have commented on how gruesome the deaths are and so she was uh she was death number one and we hadn't seen that up until this point in Stranger Things so all of us are kind of like what is this what's going on why why are these kids floating all of a sudden their eyes are rolling back and uh all of a sudden, their their limbs are just, you know, twisted. So Vecna is this bad guy. And it, I, I think it's the first time that we've seen an intellectual villain, an actual yes. Yes. A sentient being with a mind, with smarts. You know, up until now, it's been these demogorgons and sort of, you know, there have been like, you know, the Russians here and there. But this is like an actual upside down villain. And we see him and he looks like a cross between Swamp Thing and pretty much every nightmare character you can think of kind of rolled into one. Yeah, Freddy Krueger, Pinhead. Um, Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up because I was thinking the the same thing. Previous seasons, well, Russians aside, a lot of the villains were just these mindless monsters. And so finally we get this character who has a personality. So it's I guess I kind of compare it to slasher films from the 80s where you had uh, Michael Myers, you had Jason, who were just these unstoppable forces of nature. And then when you get to Freddy... He actually has a personality, and so uh, he could actually interact and have conversations uh, with the victims. And he gets into their gets into their minds. Gets and in their minds, you know. And, yeah. And just like Freddie, he's going after teens. So, and like you said, his look—he gets, you know, he gets deformed, he gets dis- disfigured, uh, like Freddie. And then, of course, he has the hand. So he has that one large hand, which I think is pretty common with like uh, Satan or demonic characters. They might have like one limb that's oversized or like a cloven hoof or something like that, but. You know, Freddy has the glo- uh, his glove, and so Vecna had this really long hand that he would kind of like place over their faces, very similar to how Freddy Krueger used to do to his victims in the movies. Doc, you know, you seem to know a lot about these demonic characters. You got something to tell me? Hmm? Dungeons and uh, Dragons, de- demon worshipper? Yeah, I play some. I play some D and D. Yeah, 
Yep. <laughs> Actually, I don't. I have friends who have invited me to play. Um, I'd love to hear it. Uh, who knows? Maybe one day I'll, I'll jump in and uh, I'll roll the dice. Die. I'm dice. sure Dungeons and Dragons sales have surged since Stranger Things debuted in 2016. And oh, yeah. uh, I wouldn't know, but I'm sure they have. So Vecna becomes this baddie that can't be stopped in the sense that he I think they figure out he's from the upside down but he does enter people's dreams and we can get into sort of how they figure out how to combat it but what it does is unlock a mystery within a mystery and you know, as the show pivots around to the different characters spending time in Russia with what Hopper's going through and we find that Joyce has been uh, sent a you know a message from him from Russia or she thinks it's from him and she teams up with Murray and Murray is a character that God bless the producers for finding this guy and making him, you know, he came in as sort of an advisor, nutcase, conspirator source that they would go to for help with Russian translating. And they bumped (laughs) the actor up to like main character. Like a series regular, yeah. You know the actor. He's a great actor. Do you remember where we've seen him before? Oh, yeah. He was uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge's uh, asshole brother-in-law, brother-in-law on Fleabag. In Fleabag, yeah. And he was great in that. And here he brought that over, but he's a, a nicer, a lot nicer, but still kind of a dick character. Yeah. And so Murray becomes the ally. And I think part of it is they needed to pair Joyce up with somebody on her little adventure. And since Hopper is in prison, he becomes the damsel in distress. You know, Joyce is Prince Charming and Murray is basically Donkey. <laughs> <laughs> she's Shrek and he's donkey uh, so he was hilarious and so they and there's that one morning where he made waffles right yeah so he basically they have to find their way to Russia through Alaska and there's some you know hijinks to get them there to connect those two hey we'll be right back hey you guys this is Tara and boy oh boy do I wish I was about to talk to you about some super cool product or like a neat movie coming out but I'm not because America Here at Cinema Craptaculous, we recognize that the medical privacy rights of millions of American women are no longer protected, and that safe and affordable reproductive care will not be accessible to women in every state. Each month, we'll share a podcast or organization that helps highlight and support women's reproductive rights and access to safe health care. And this is John to tell you that this month, we'd like to highlight RAP, which stands for Women's Reproductive Rights Assistance Project. RAP is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that helps bridge the financial gap for disadvantaged people who seek an abortion or emergency contraceptives. You can find more information and donate at RAP.org. That's W-R-R-A-P dot org. Thank you. And now, back to the show. But what happens back in L.A. is we learn that there's this other group of people, kind of this other villainous subset that is, of course, the government. And it's not clear early on whether they are a new set of government body or if they're an extension of Dr. Brenner and the Hawkins lab work. So she gets abducted. And that is at a really hard point because she and Mike are having relationship problems. She's just had this bullying incident where she lashed out at a girl at a roller rink, busted her nose with a roller skate. So she she would get sent to juvie if, ironically, the government didn't kidnap her. So it actually, the horrible thing that happens when she gets kidnapped actually saves her from probably being sent up for two years. Oh, yeah. But how satisfying was that scene? Like when she took that roller skate to, to the bully's face? Oh, she like busts that girl's head open. I mean, we, oof. We, we don't approve it. We don't approve it. Uh, you know, you should never go yeah. Will Smith on someone. But um, yeah, just seeing her do that, you know, she didn't have, imagine if she had her abilities and like went off on her. Yeah. Well, that's so. the whole point is, is that everybody knows in the scientific world that the upside down world is a bigger threat than we're led to believe. And the only possible hope we have is this little girl who was part of the program. So she gets yanked back and we find out that Dr. Brenner, played by Matthew Modine, is indeed alive after kind of teasing that he might be from season one. Yeah, and did, he did they, is. I'm sorry. Did they explain that? Like, uh, I kind of missed that. Like, how did he come back? I, I don't remember. I, I know that they showed a lot of flashbacks and brought Matthew Bo- Modine back over the years, but. I don't think they actually explained how he survived being attacked by a Demogorgon in the first film. I don't remember. Yeah. But um, so he's back and, uh, you know, wants to help her regain her powers alongside Paul Reiser's character. But you're, you're still you don't know what to make of this guy. And they do a really interesting job of reintroducing the whole altered states world where she's you know immersed in the deprivation tank and she's back into her younger self. So we're seeing her mind trying to remember sort of her time and they yeah. her head gets shaved again. And by the way, the poor actress did not shave her head. Millie Bobby Brown was wearing a wig. It was a very, very good wig. Uh, yeah. But thankfully, they, uh, they didn't make her shave her head again. <laughs> and they also did the, uh, the whole body double thing where they had a younger actress 
And then they, they put her yeah. face yeah. put a face on the actress. So it opens up this whole mystery of did she kill all everybody on this floor? And I don't I can't remember if that's something we had seen in season one with Dr. Brenner, where he says, what did you do? And you find there's blood everywhere and the whole staff and all the guards and all the other kids are all just a horrible mess of blood. And, you know, she's thinking that this memory that's that's been dogging her is her having killed it. And there's a mystery that starts to unravel that ties into Vecna. Yeah, like you're saying, um, that whole scene, I don't remember if they touched upon that in previous seasons, but when they showed us after that, I was kind of like, wow, Eleven is a straight up murderer. She's a mass murderer. That's the yeah. impression that I got. And right. uh, they did a good yeah, job of really keeping that, keeping that in our in the forefront of our thoughts. And there's you know there's a an intern that is trying to kind of help her. That you get the sense that he may or may not be working with them, but he's trying to help her. And at the same time, they're they're cutting back to the uh, the Scooby Gang. You know, um, Nancy and. Steve and Robin and the, Dusty the, Buns. They're all right. And so they're all trying to protect Eddie, but also figure out that this thing is going on. And it, it seems to have targeted students who have had psychological problems, who have talked to a counselor. And one of those, of course, is Max, uh, the cute redheaded girl whose brother Billy was killed at the end of the last season. And she's suffering a lot of PTSDs. She's become very detached from her friends. She's broken up with Lucas who has now joined the jocks on the basketball team, kind of distanced himself. And so the group's kind of fractured, but it's discovered that this Vecna is targeting her. That ties into the whole Freddy Krueger storyline, which also ties into the L storyline. Yeah, Mac, the Max character this season, played by Sadie Sink, did an amazing job. You know, they had introduced her, was it season two? She's meshed perfectly with the uh, with the group. Yeah, especially this season. They, they gave her some really great scenes that, uh, yeah, she moved up the list as one of my more favorite characters. But of course, that leads up to, I don't know if you wanted to talk about the, uh, the graveyard scene. Well, I think it's a good sort of jumping off point because uh, we spend too much in the weeds and the plot. Yeah. Uh, we're going to sort of lose sight uh, of our time and also the things that were just great about this season. I think the show has been great to bring 80s culture in and they show they've been playing songs throughout all of the seasons you know for instance i just discovered the soundtrack from season one and it's a bunch of various artists there's the police echo and the bunnymen the bangles cindy lopper but this season just became a breakout season for music yeah totally watching previous seasons you know you'd hear different songs and you're like i remember that song but this season i guess starting with kate bush's running up that hill and this ties into the uh, Max Graveyard scene. It just took off. I remember that song when it originally came out. Kate Bush wasn't as big here in the US. Uh, In the UK, she was huge. She had a bunch of hits over there. But running up that hill, all of a sudden, after that scene, which was an amazing scene, just has like shot up the charts. Download, uh, just this radio play. And that's just one song. And it's huge. And, you know, she's even like reached out or like tweeted or something saying that she's super appreciative, you know, and she's making crazy cash on the song. I mean, they could have picked any song. It was basically a song that is Max's favorite song that they figure out is a way to pull her out, kind of like finding her happy thought. It can pull her out away from the um, upside down world and Vecna's clutches. And so she, she character has to end up like listening to it nonstop for, you know, <laughs> the foreseeable future. And she's all nervous, like, well, what if it stops being my favorite song? I'm like, I think listening to it 24 seven, I think it probably would be. Yeah, you know, you never know what song is going to click, but uh, it definitely did. And uh, yeah, you go on social media and people are using it on TikTok. Um, you know, it shows up on YouTube. Uh, it's it's incredible. Definitely a phenomenon. Well, I think the show really, that's where it, it kind of hits its home runs is when it really blends the nostalgia of the, the older audience that's watching it with the young kids. Because I'm assuming that those downloads are not old people just downloading a song that they probably have in their CD collection. You yeah. know, it's so anyway, I thought that was cool. And also Masters of uh, Master of Puppets by Metallica. Yeah. Yep. That, that's uh, that's an Eddie's wheelhouse world. That's, and um, that's like the most metal scene ever. <laughs> yeah. The thing that was really cool is that we're dealing with Elle's torment and journey where she has to get she's under the gun to get her powers back. But things go bad because those well, we never know what they are. Those anti Fox Mulder people show up to the base and I thought they were all working together. It turns out that they're actually not working with Dr. Brenner or the other doctor. They're got their own agenda 
And they come in and start shooting at everybody. And then the Dr. Brenner people in the compound start shooting back. So I, I was kind of a little confused because I feel like it's battle of the bad government scientist people. Yeah. So it's like not only did they split up all the kids into three groups, but they got the government agents. And they split them into two. Uh, right. Yeah. Similar, you know, similar story for me when I was watching it. I was a little confused because I was like, all right. That's a government agent. Whose side are they on? You kind of never knew who to trust. And then, uh, you know, especially um, that one shootout scene in the uh, in the buyer's house in California. It's like a one take shot. I think that was Sean Levy that did that, directed yeah. that episode. And that was great. It was really cool seeing that. But while they're doing it, I was imagining myself as like one of the characters, and like how would I react in that situation where bullets are flying in my house and I have to like get out of there, hop in a van and take off. Well, going back to the house. So that group, which is Mike and Will and Will's brother, um, Jonathan, Jonathan, they they end up rescuing Elle. But before that, before they know that she's in trouble, they get, they basically get shot at and they introduce this new character this season named Argyle. Argyle. Does anybody know the dead dude's name? What? Dead dude. I'm making him a headstone. And you do realize we spent all morning hiding the body. Well, I'll just write, uh, here lies unknown hero agent man. Yeah, saved. Argyle, Jonathan, Will, and Mike from certain death. You're gonna write our names on the pizza box. Pretty common names. And Argyle is like... He's the Spicoli of uh, Stranger Things. He is the Spicoli. Long hair, pot smoking, works at a pizza joint, which Spicoli wouldn't have done. But he He, kind of comes to the rescue. Spicoli would order from Surfer Boy Pizza. Right. That's true. So, and he and Jonathan are token out. And Jonathan, of course, is, you know, his girlfriend, Nancy's on the other side of the country and they're having a hard time because they're getting close to college exam, uh, college applications. And he's smart enough to go to school. And I think their plan is they're going to go to school together, but he's kind of feeling like, you know, maybe she should be, maybe I'm holding her back, you know? So there's you know, that sort of like split relationship there. There's a split relationship with Mike and L and we're starting to see another relationship that we never really paid attention to. You want to talk uh, a bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, sorry, really quick before we hop into that, Nancy and Jonathan, that whole storyline where they're splitting up. Uh, do you think that came about because Steve is such a fan favorite? Or do you think uh, some of Charlie Heaton's like legal issues that he had gotten into with like bringing in drugs, narcotics into the country or something like that? You don't remember that? Oh, I don't know. And, and weren't the actors actually dating in real life? Yeah, yeah, they're dating. I don't know if they're still dating now. They might be. But uh, yeah, he had, he had gotten in, into some trouble. And this seri- uh, this season was shot like over a year ago, closer to when that happened. So I wonder if they were kind of like bracing, kind of preparing if they weren't going to be able to use him. So yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know what your I think are. Steve is a very popular character. And we should note that he and Nancy are part of the, the Dustin Max the group that are sort of doing this detective work with Robin too, trying to find what is Vecna? How do we stop him? How do we save Max? So it conveniently allows the other group of characters that are kind of trying to find Eleven um, to be separated. And we learn that that Will, who has been a gracious brother to uh, Elle when Joyce brought her into the fold after Hopper disappeared, but we start to learn that Will has had feelings for Mike that, that may you know, that may be more than friendship. And it's something that I don't know that they really hinted at before, probably because the, the actor was younger. I have not sought out like troll comments or any kind of yeah. negative backlash to that. I've tried to really like, I don't even want to read that because I felt like they handled it very subtly. And I think they handled it very responsibly mm-hmm. in the course of their storyline, especially in this very emotional sort of scene in the second part. Yeah, um, uh, for me, watching a previous season, it might have been the third, there was like one slight hint to it. It was Mike and him talking, I guess, down in the basement where they would play D&D. I kind of got the feeling they were going to go in that direction. But yeah, going to the scene in the van for this season, I thought that was really great. Um, Noah and did an amazing job basically conveying his feelings to Mike. But instead of saying him, he was saying that it was L. And then, uh, of course, yeah, Jonathan, the bigger brother who like looks in the rearview mirror and sees his brother going through that. And Will, who's been through, I mean, in reality, has been through more things than anybody could imagine. He was in an upside down world the whole first season. He is trying to keep it together to be there for his friend and he had to be there for Eleven. I thought it was a really interesting dynamic and and it comes um, on the heels of another dynamic they introduced last season, which was Steve meeting Robin, played by Maya Hawke. And it's one of my favorite parts of this season and of the series is this really great friendship and I felt like they're dynamic and they have little you know they have a lot of scenes a lot of dialogue together and they're both there for each other they both 
try to support each other when they are unable to find love. And I just think it's a great element to the series. And they're not overplaying their hand, I don't think. I think they're also doing a good job of keeping sort of questioning your sexuality in the context of the 80s. Because I think people yeah. forget that, you know, they, these kids didn't have pride events at their school, depending on where they lived. And if they lived in a small town, it would even be more of a closeted environment they'd have to keep themselves in, you know? Yeah, definitely, for sure. You know, back in the 80s, you know, now today, you know, people talk more about it. Uh, there's a lot of support. But back then, it was very secret. Don't talk about it. You know, this series is aware of trying to sort of show a more kind of a diverse environment in their cast and characters, but also realizing that in the 80s, there were still things that people wouldn't even have put a label on. And I think they're really trying to be smart about that. I'll, I'll be curious to see where they go in season five, if they overplay their hand or underplay their hand. Yeah. I think this is this has been a great season to sort of explore not just the 80s, but just adolescence in the 80s. And make it's hard because you don't want to just do a replay of John Hughes homages. And I think they've been really careful not to do that. Yeah, I, this season, I think they were kind of light on the John Hughes uh, nods. You know, some people pointed out that Eddie Munson in the gym was pointing out the different uh, social groups. So people compared that to the uh, Breakfast Club, how Judd Nelson's character you know, was pointing out what each of them were. But I think that was pretty much it. Well, you know, there is a girl that Robin has a big crush on in her class, yeah. and she looks a heck of a lot like Molly totally. Ringwald from yes. Pretty in Pink. That was that was pretty. Yeah, by that was nicely done. Something else, you know, since you brought up Robin and uh, the Molly Ringwald adjacent character, uh, something that was cool what Steve did when she when Robin was feeling down because she didn't know if the girl was into her or not. Uh, they're at the video store and he points out that a Molly Ringwald girl, she returned Fast Times at Ridgemont High and it was paused or stopped at 53 minutes and five seconds, which was the Phoebe Cates scene where she's coming out of the pool. So she had been watching it. She left it right there. And so Steve points that out to her uh, being a cool friend. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that's, yeah. those little touches. So going back to Vecna, he is layered into this season as... To me, what they were saying was that he actually is the big bad. He was thrown into the uh, the upside down, saw, you know, Demogorgons, Demodogs, found the swarm that was introduced in Russia and using his abilities, didn't he create that form that, that we, that the kids called the Mind Flayer because he had that like obsession with the, the spiders? So I, th I thought he was controlling that swarm and he made that form. So that's the impression that I got. So in the end, he is the mastermind. But, you know, that doesn't explain where the underworld comes from because the upside, I keep saying underworld, uh, too, right? the upside down world, because we basically learn that, and this is the biggest spoiler, and it's done, it's done at the end of, of part one. So if you finish part one, you know, it's not a spoiler and it's done kind of in a cool way. It's like they wrap up this mystery of who Vecna is. But then there's still the other part of the season where they have to figure out how to stop him, save Max. Take him And down. he basically is revealed in their detective work. They discover there was a father in a house who was put away for murdering his family. At least that's what the public was told back, you know, 20 years earlier. And something doesn't sit right. And so the kids go visit. Uh, it was actually Robin and Nancy pretend to be psychology students. They, very, they try to be like... It was very Silence of the Lambs, them walking down the hallway. Yeah. And, and so they go in and they meet this guy and it's a stunt cast. And who did they cast? Robert Englund, Freddy Krueger himself. And uh, his character is older and he's... Uh, because he felt such guilt, he, he sliced his eyes so that he couldn't I don't know, because I think there was he was aware of an evil and it took his family. And anyway, so he's, he's blinded and he tells the story of this family. Uh, uh, that whole flashback telling the story that was very Amityville horror or poltergeist. We have like a family moving into a house that has something going on and ends badly. You know, what they did in the season is they didn't just say, OK, this is a flashback story. And we learned the backstory uh, that, you know, that there was a killer, an entity that killed the family, not this dad who's now innocently been put away. But it's actually tied to their story because they realize that that house exists in the upside down world. And Max, who um, at one point does get pulled into Vecna's lair, that's in that world. And the house is where Vecna hangs out. So it ties into Vecna, not just in the fact that there was a house that, that these murders happened, but also that that house is in the upside down world and it's pivotal. This is a season where the kids actually want to go into the upside down world and they discover there are these portals all around Hawkins. It's not just the lab. You know, they know that to stop Vecna, they have to get on his turf. Yeah, they, they go hunting. Yeah, and it, it unfortunately came nearly at the peril of Max. There was an episode where we didn't know it was going to happen and they kind of led up to like where she's going to die at the end of the episode. That was a great scene. 
Yeah, and that's where Kate Bush's song comes into play, and that's realized that they can pull her out through music and a happy thought. And But yeah. this character of Victor Creel, played by Robert Englund, there's some secret that he's got. What did you think of that? Did you think that was a, a, a kind of a clever reveal? In the end, yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was clever. Uh, I thought it was a little weird that uh, all of a sudden this orderly was kind of befriending her, and she so easily, openly accepted him. But uh, yeah, the, the whole reveal was was really nice i know i had I had, had conversations with friends previously or like after season one that we wondered if back then we thought the mind flayer or like the big bad would be another kid who was in the program yeah possibly number one and so when they had this big reveal it was kind of like, okay cool all right but the way that they did it was uh, a lot better than i imagined it i honestly did totally forgot that i remember that they did reveal these other powered characters remember in season two they kind of have a storyline that they abandon where 11 gets out in the real world and she's in the city hanging out with these tough kids and turns out they're all they all have powers and they totally just like dropped that whole storyline. None of those characters have come back. Yeah, it wasn't a popular episode, but uh, I kind of wonder if in the fifth season, if somehow they'll bring them back. Who knows? They might. Because um, after what happens at the end of the fourth season, Eleven's going to need some backup. The big reveal, of course, is that this um, orderly, we find out that he was one. And not only was he one, but that he was he was the Creel kid, Henry Creel, who was in the household with his mom and dad and this kid was starting to go bad, but he had these powers. He had the shining. <laughs> and um, yeah, he just turns into a little uh, a little Michael Myers. What's crazy about it is that a lot of stories where they have villains, you know, they have like tragic backstories of how and what led them to this life of crime or made them evil. This kid is just like, as a kid, he was just straight up evil. It's never really clear how he ends up becoming an orderly. Like they were suppressing him. They were suppressing his powers. And I don't know if he had just, they gave him a job there to keep an eye on him or if they knew they needed to find somebody just like him maybe to, uh, because, you know, she, Eleven is the one that opened up all the, the original portal to the upside down world, right? Yeah. And it came out of that incident where we think that she killed everybody because she was experiencing some bullying by the other kids. But it turns out that she was not the one to go on the killing spree. She just was in instrument of one who uh, as an adult who is pretending to be her friend and orderly who just needs her help to kind of break the restrictions so that he can get his powers unleashed and then he kills everybody and it's not 11 it's this guy she repressed this memory but she confronts one you know it's the whole thing like you know you could join me and we could be you know we could be powerful together and she's like no and this is young 11 by the way this is in the flashback and she sends him like destroys him essentially right and sends him through the upside down where he becomes Vecna. Yeah. Once Elle realizes that she wasn't the one who did all that killing, that the flashback is is indeed a memory, but it's not a memory of things she did, but what one did. Then it, she's now, you know, she's Luke Skywalker. She's Superman in Superman 2 getting his powers back. She is now the Elle we know, and she's got to get back to her friends. And the problem is, is that they're separated by distance. Now, maybe this was a COVID thing or if it was just like, well, how are we going to get her back to Hawkins? So she actually is able to help them telepathically. She is rescued from the uh, compound and there's a big cathartic scene with she and Brenner, where Brenner, who we recognize he's the villain, but as I understand it, Matthew Modine really didn't want him per- he didn't see him as a villain. He saw him as a very misguided scientist who really loved his subjects his lab rats in a and twisted way he, in a twisted way and he wanted and i kind of take modine's side because if he was just an evil doctor i think that's 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 two-dimensional and i think that no villain thinks that they're doing villainous things it may have been confusing but i think it also helped with l having to kind of realize like i get that i call him papa but in the end he took my childhood and I, I've got to leave him. So he, she, he's basically left for dead. And I think he does die in the desert. I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> he dies I mean, again. He dies again. And so she, uh, she's rescued by the boys in their pizza van. And they, they fill up a tub with salt water because they know that she can enter into Max's mind remotely. And they've got this crazy plan back in Hawkins to enter kind of like Nightmare on Elm Street Dream Warriors, right? Yeah. Well, I think you're right about the uh, pandemic influencing the... Uh... The storyline, because uh, in that uh, salt bath, Elle was basically zooming in. So She's totally zooming in. Yeah. Yeah. So she gets into the mine, and it's weird because that last finale, I think it was like, was it two hours? It was like a two-hour movie. It was two and a half hours. So the last two episodes, it was four hours worth because the second to last was an hour and a half, and the very last was two and a half hours. I think people are saying that about our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and part two coming uh, in two months. We, we should split this up. Anyway, it was pretty amazing finale because it takes place in the Upside Down and these kids go in there, they all get weapons. And we should point out that it is determined that the killings in Hawkins of these kids is by a satanic cult because the head... The, the jock, the sort of the Johnny Lawrence of the season, and he's the one that's been after Munson because he thinks he killed his girlfriend. He's like, Eddie summoned a demon, and there's yep. demons. And so word gets out into town that, yes, these Dungeons and Dragons people have summoned demons, and the whole town which they didn't really go into too much, but they're all getting guns, and I don't know what their plan was. It's a lynch mob mentality. They're just gunning for Eddie. And they have that scene where they show the like the uh, army surplus store, or the uh, the gun shop, and everyone's just there, even like kids, just buying weapons. And I know that they're sort of touching into like you know those old zombie apocalypse movies, like Night of the Living Dead. But I think there was a little bit of political commentary too about uh, yeah, for sure. You know, they're pissed about the election being stolen, if you know what I mean. America. Yeah. So these kids, they get all these guns. They're actually going into the underworld by themselves to take on Vecna to save Max, because and Max is kind of the bait. And then it, it got trippy because then they're in. It's getting into Inception. Territory territory where Eleven <laughs> is Zoom calling into Max's mind and she goes into a memory and then another memory inside the memory to sort of unearth these places where Max felt the most happy. But Max also has to kind of confront some of her demons that Vecna is able to you know, sort of play on and uh, how they're able to pull her out. Well, she gets pretty badly beaten up. Really bad. I didn't think they'd kill her because it's like, well, they teased killing her, but like maybe they will kill her. But what happens is, is they... Uh, I always joke around with S'more for like different storylines. I don't like it when they kill off characters. My solution is just put the character in a coma. So right. Put him on go. ice. Like, yeah, like, ice. like Wakanda. But, you know, L is able to sort of battle this Vecna character, a.k.a. Henry Keel, a- a.k.a. Peter Broward, a.k.a. One. He has four names <laughs> inside of Max's mind, which takes place in the prom, the gymnasium of the prom from the end of season three. At first, I believed you had sent me to my death to purgatory but i was wrong i was somewhere new anyway so there's all these hijinks going on but they're kind of late because max technically gets killed and in that window where she may may or may not live vecna achieves his goal it's basically thanos's snap and it's that moment that sort of changes things forever and we can kind of this is where we're going to wrap up I totally got series finale of Buffy the Vampire Slayer vibes when Sunnydale was pulled into the Hellmouth. Hawkins didn't get pulled in, but it just split wide open. It split wide open. Uh, so I'm assuming that Demogorgons, Demodogs will be pouring out. And uh, they, they all seemed a little too calm after that happened. Yeah, it was a gas leak. <laughs> huge gas leak. <laughs> yeah, it's like we're seeing, literally, you are seeing the town of Hawkins in this huge, very expensive, oh, and they spent on this season, CGI, very impressive, like, you know, a, a Roland Emmerich movie. We're seeing, like, fissures of like lava like something out of a you know a lava volcano movie cutting through the town pulling down buildings ripping people in half right johnny Did lawrence that? whatever that guy's character yeah he yeah, uh, the, the 80s uh jock bully the blonde bully. yeah the, the blonde bully gets ripped in half because he's fighting yeah. lucas in the house so yeah i mean this is the stuff that would be global headlines and and the next day it's like well a 7.1 earthquake rocked the city of hawkins 22 people are missing i'm like what well, who knows? Maybe that's uh, what's being reported. And maybe next season we'll see the government has moved in and they're just trying to keep it quiet. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. But, you know, the next and it's it was the longest epilogue after a, a cathartic, you know, battle scene ever. It was it was, it was like Lord of the Rings. I, multiple. Endings. Oh, my gosh. You know, you're basically sort of seeing the aftermath. Max did survive barely, but she's, you know, <laughs> she looks like in a coma. She's seen better days. Yes, uh, definitely. She looks like Wile E. Coyote after the piano has been dropped on her. Um, yeah. One scene from uh, <clears throat> as they're wrapping it up that uh, seemed a little awkward was Dustin talking to uh, Eddie Munson's uncle. Cause it he was, was a little forced. Yeah, like I wish they hadn't really shown the conversation. Maybe he just approached him and they like panned away. Yeah, I think they wanted to give a button on Eddie's character. The town still thinks that he killed all these these teenagers, so he's the town serial killer pariah that, that may be one of the missing. Yeah. He does go out with a blaze of glory, literally. He's in the upside down world sort of baiting all of these bat creatures away from the kids so they can go deal with Vecna. Because everything in the upside down world exists in real life, like homes, yeah. 
so they can go to their own homes and find like, oh, there's my, you know, my journal, there's my guitar. And so he gets his guitar in the upside down world. And um, he's got the uh, the lightning bolts. He's got the red sky. He's got the bats swirling. He's standing on top of the trailer with his axe. He's barking at the moon and he yeah. gets, he does die. And it is an honorable death because he does. And I think they wanted to give Dustin, the actor. Gaden Matarazzo. They want to give him a big meaty yeah. scene. Hey, really, really quick. Can we get a quick moment of silence for Eddie Munson? Yes. Let's all have a quick moment of silence for it's Eddie Munson. Heads. We'll remember you forever, Eddie. Through, through the, the sacrifice, sacrifice you made. <laughs> Can't I believe the price you paid. Yep, okay, but we're good. blending genres. Rest in peace, Eddie Munson. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is quite the episode. Obviously, we've spoiled the hell out of it. I think we've we've talked about everything that we loved. I did like the Russia stuff. I questioned it. I love seeing Murray become this badass karate Russian speaking <laughs> soldier of fortune as he and Joyce, you know, find their way to this gulag in sort of this um, Black that- Widow uh, type rescue operation of Hopper, and uh, they do reunite <laughs> Hopper and Joyce, saving the um, Red Guardian. Yeah, exactly. Part of it is you have to sideline the adults so that the kids can be kids, you know. And I think in season five, you know, it'll be weird to see because up until then, you know, Hopper was the protector. Well, these kids can kind of hold their own now. You know, they they really don't need Hopper or adults. And again, the um, cast is so huge that I think they're kind of struggling a little bit to give everyone something to do or eat. Uh... Equal time. Like, for example, Mike wasn't really a pivotal character this season. No, and, and neither was Jonathan. I Jonathan. think, you know, and it's hard to know if that's based on fan service or if sort of like the writers feel like, because I think Will is going to have a much more central role in the next season. Oh, hopefully, because I know in season one, he was pretty, well, he was MIA because he was in the Upside Down. He was the MacGuffin. Yeah, he's who yeah. they're going after. So what would you like to see in season five? And it's the finale. Like, how do you want to see the show wrap up? Yeah, you know, I'm really not sure. Uh, yeah, these days I try not to think too much about it because uh, if I get ideas in my head of how I want it to wrap up, then I get really disappointed. But um, kind of like what we mentioned previously, I definitely want to see some kind of government you know, task force or something in Hawkins because if the government doesn't show up, then it's kind of like, okay, that's a little unbelievable. They would show up if a city in the U.S. got torn apart like that. But something I would like to see, I want to see some uh, Demogorgons and Demodo- uh, Demodogs and even Bats coming out and just being in the uh, the right side up. You know, I want to see them like running around, running, uh, rampaging around the town. So you want to see uh, Demogorgon World Dominion. <laughs> but with a better script. You know, one of the things that these shows that have these big fan followings and they're building up to an ending have to be careful of is the the explanation of things. Because if they set something up that needs to be explained and they do it wrong or they don't do it to the satisfaction of the uh, of the audience, I should say, then they get crucified. Previously on Lost. Right. Previously on Game of Thrones. Because I don't know, you know, they do want to put this on a shelf so that people who haven't watched Stranger Things will discover it and maybe watch the whole season again. And if word gets out, it's a crappy ending. Some people may not bother. So I think that is always the uh, the big challenge. I'd like to think that they had that ending in mind and they've been writing backwards a little bit because that's the best way to do it where you know how it's going to end. You know, I think Breaking Bad might have been like that. They kind of knew how it was going to end and they worked their way to that. And that's going to be a little easier because then you're not going to be writing yourself in a corner. With Eleven, you know, I think we want to see like how can she just have a regular, you know, can these kids have regular lives after going through this? That's kind of the, I hope they don't do some sort of time jump where they're all five years have gone by and they're all like postgraduate students and stuff. I think that's actually going to happen. I think they, the next season is going to be in the 90s. I think it's going to be a jump. Oh, which means we're going to skip graduation, which I guess if the school got destroyed, I don't know. Those kids are all grown up, man. From season one to the latest season, it's like they were little kids when they started. We got to see them grow up. Oh, uh, the um, Duffer brothers said that some of them, I mean, there was like a 10, almost a 10 month to a year gap for some of the characters, you know, and they definitely changed. Overall, I really liked the season. The first part, I was kind of wondering where they were going with it. It's a different tone, but it all kind of came together in that last half hour of uh, part one. And then, uh, yeah, I got excited because 4th of July weekend, they released the last two episodes of part two. Personally, I thought those episodes were a little too long. I would have liked them cut up a little bit more or just edited down a little bit. Yeah. But overall, thumbs up to uh, season four. It's uh, it's one of my favorite seasons. It doesn't top season one, but I'm really looking forward to season five. I agree. I think this was a really good season. I cannot commend everybody enough on this fucking show because, I mean, to shoot this during COVID, and that may have started it before COVID. I honestly didn't want to do a ton of homework on it because 
because I didn't want to spoil what, like, I don't want to find out that I did find out some things that were fun. Jamie Bowers Campbell, is that the actor's name? He actually wore the Vecna suit. Like it was a practical costume and he did the voice. They showed him do an ADR. He talked like the, he actually affects the voice. They didn't need to do that, but he really, you know, they made, they give the actor the opportunity. It was tough to sort of see it split up too much because it's like all of a sudden we're in Russia and we're meeting, you know, the alliance as he meets a guard and, you know, and how's he going to get out of that? And yeah, they bring the Demogorgon in, but it's almost like its own sort of separate storyline. But they wove it together. And I mean, my gosh, how can you complain about this show? It gave you so much entertainment for your couch. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Well, on that note. Thank you to our listeners, both openly geeky and closeted geeky, for joining us on this expanded universe journey. This has been Doc. And with me, as always, is my geektacular co-host. John H.H. And remember that this is your safe space to talk about all things geeky in the current world or upside down world. And where you can get your geek on. Geek Geek out! out! Hey, Expanded Universe fans, thank you for joining. No, I'm sorry. It's not Vecna. Don't be scared. And Netflix, please don't sue me. All right, let's do this again. Hey, Expanded Universe fans, thank you again for joining us on another Geektacular journey. If you'd like to comment and give us some feedback on our show, things you like, things you didn't like, maybe there's a geek topic or movie you want us to cover or review, give us a shout. We'd love to hear from you. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Our handle is at Craptaculous. We're also on Facebook. Oh, and make sure you check out all our other shows. There's a new one every week. There's the B-Sides, Real Debates, and of course, Cinema Craptaculous. And you can find more about our shows and our hosts at CinemaCraptaculous.com. And you can learn more at cinemacraptaculous.com. Wait a second, that wasn't my voice. Who said that? Uh...